Hello and welcome to the Focusing Way podcast. I'm your host, David Battistella. Please share this podcast with others as a way of introducing them to the people, themes, concepts, and beauty of focusing. Our website is thefocusingway.com. Follow us on Twitter at The Focusing Way. This podcast is available on iTunes and Stitcher. Our philosophy is simple. Focusing for better living. If you really enjoy this, you can support us by making a contribution via Patreon as well. All the links are on the website. Now, on to the good stuff. Today on the Focusing Way podcast, Changes Groups with Dr. Kathy McGuire. ch 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 changes That single word stuttered at us by David Bowie in his hallmark song, Changes, piped into my ears and hit me. Perhaps like a lot of other people, it hit me, me directly. I was one of those listeners, feeling like the world and everything around me was changing at a pace I could not really handle, and now someone else was, through his music, telling it back to me, letting me know that they were feeling it too. With a guitar and a microphone, he suddenly was telling everybody what he was feeling and what we as a collective were feeling at the same time. A sense of community formed around the ideas in that song. They were the stars and we were fans and together we knew something everyone else could not quite grasp. Now I know you all want to hear the song now, but I can only play you seven seconds without infringing copyright, so here's a little refresher. Ah, yes. Well, changes were happening before that song was released, and it was at the University of Chicago where a group of Dr. Jean Genlin's psychology students needed a place to work out some things. They began meeting to discuss the changes going on around them, and these early changes groups evolved as a formal focusing practice. A community formed, And that community began working with focusing in a group setting. These groups were called changes groups. One of the people who was right there and will describe her experiences is Dr. Kathy McGuire, who was a student of Dr. Eugene Gendlin at the time. Dr. Kathy McGuire got a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Chicago, working directly with Dr. Eugene Genlin. She was a focusing-oriented therapist and workshop facilitator for 40 years. Her many articles and manuals can be found at her website for Creative Edge Focusing, cefocusing.com. As a co-founder of the original Changes Listening Focusing Community in 1971, Dr. McGuire sees empathic listening and experiential focusing as co-equal skills. From her experience, a Changes community is a training laboratory in how to live in community, how to overcome prejudice, and increase tolerance for difference and uniqueness. People can practice not only focusing, but interpersonal conflict resolution and group decision-making using listening-focusing skills. And joining me now is Dr. Kathy McGuire. Dr. McGuire, Kathy, thank you so much for being with us today. Mm-hmm. Um, I just wanted to begin, uh, because we're focusing on changes in this episode, on changes and changes groups, I'd like to just begin by asking you about your experiences in the first changes groups and meetings and maybe sharing what they were like. 
Okay, so the first changes community started forming as a response to the Kent State Massacre, which in the United States was a time in the Vietnam protests when the National Guard fired upon protesting students and killed several of them at a university. Four persons, including two women, were shot and killed on Kent State University's campus today during renewed demonstrations involving hundreds of students. The university was ordered closed as disorders continued for more than two hours. Six other persons were reported shot in addition to those killed. The four persons were killed during a clash between students and members of the Ohio National Guard outside Taylor Hall near the University Commons, where an Army ROTC building was burned down Saturday night. I don't care whether you've never listened to anyone before in your lives. shot was fired, the officer added, closely followed by several other shots, these by guardsmen. Officers with the guard continued, ordered an immediate ceasefire, and continued to move the, to the commons where ambulances were dispatched to move the casualties. This is John Preston Smith reporting from Kent State University for WKSU News. So a bunch of us graduate students, as well as Eugene Gendlin, got together to figure out our response. And we tried various things like getting petitions signed, and then we decided we needed to find something that was really more specific to our own quest as a clinical psychology students and developmental psychology students. So we started a hotline, which was a kind of a thing to do in those days, kind of a suicide and drug talk down phone hotline. But we were unique in that we invited everybody who called on that hotline to come to a meeting on Sunday evenings where we really tried to teach everyone <clears throat> as equals both focusing and listening skills. Now, to get to that point, we had a lot of meetings about what we were going to do. And those meetings were just as bad as everybody's meetings. And Jenlin was part of those meetings and, uh, and suffered from the frustration that we all did and also tried to input his own perspective. And eventually he just said, we have to stop having meetings and start doing what we're talking about. And what we were talking about were these empathic listening and experiential focusing skills. Mm -hmm. So we set all the decision making aside to another time before the actual meetings, and spent the meetings exchanging, focusing, and listening terms. And we did have to uh, work on developing and articulating what these skills were. So, But the general shape of the Sunday night meetings was uh, somewhere between 15 and 60 people would appear at this church. We would sometimes have a presentation uh, it could be on Gestalt, but uh, once a year, Jenlin would do a 10-week introductory uh, class. And then we would break up into pairs or triads or small groups and take turns as equals. One person closing their eyes, going inside and paying attention in a focusing way, and the other person offering uh, Carl Rogers empathic listening. Mm. And... Uh, that's uh, what we did. We invited from our hotline. We, we thought we would be open to schizophrenics, people so-called schizophrenics and drug addicts and uh, people released from prison. We were modeling ourselves on uh, what uh, R.D. Lang was doing in Scotland and having a, a community without labels. Mm -hmm. So that was very basic to our perspective, that everybody would be equals in this listening-focusing process. Yeah, I mean, the Kent State thing, triggering all of that, and um, being a young person at that time, and um, seeing that kind of thing happen to people your own age at another university, uh, what what kind of what kind of things came out of that out of did did that did that sort of um 
uh, that you know obviously generated a, a, an emotional response, and I'm just wondering how the the early focusing changes groups, the how that sort of people were coming out of that experience was it was it helping? Is that what helped you carry it forward? So there were all kinds of things going on at that time. For instance, uh, undergraduates at the University of Chicago had invaded and taken over the administration building mm -hmm. as in a sit-in. That was happening at universities. Our male fellow students were being uh, involved in the draft process. Mm -hmm. They were contemplating going to Canada. I had one fellow graduate student who was pretty much starving himself. It is his way of avoiding a draft into being in an, uh, a killing situation that was not part of his uh, spiritual or life uh, beliefs. So there was a lot going on. So Kent State was just kind of a, a mobilizing thing. And I guess maybe part of it was this uh, Spiro Agnew's attitude toward the hippies and the flower children. I mean, he really mm -hmm. spoke of us as like animals. And so I think maybe that fueled this egalitarian emphasis that was the basis of changes to not label people and, and, uh, overcome that kind of stereotyping and, and prejudice. So um, I guess that was uh, part of the basis. Does that, I don't know, does that answer that question? Or? Yeah, yeah. And, and you said a very beautiful word, egalitarian, which in a very divisive sort of uh, environment right now, globally and in the United States. And, um, you know, I, I'm just just reminded of how the focusing process it's it's rooted in 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 an exchange that is sort of equal that this sort of sharing time and taking turns and active listening processes um but that's how sort of we've come to know it right now but could you give me a sense of what the essence like what the real essence of these early meetings what 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 that was like for you Okay, so it was part of our, uh, as graduate students, it was part of our mission to develop a better model for people to be together, both in their everyday living and in their trying to work together on causes. So maybe that was part of being part of this large changing culture, but in our, our uh, meetings, for instance, I ended up doing my dissertation on incorporating listening and focusing into decision-making meetings because I would go to meetings of radical feminists or, you know, leftist people and people were just trashing each other the way people do at meetings. It was not at all simpatico with what we were talking about doing. I mean, we just were, we interrupted each other. We dominated each other. We humiliated people. And I think certainly for myself and for the people trying to make changes, we were trying to look for a different model mm -hmm. for being together. So, and that's a part of the point I wanted to make in this uh, conversation we're having, that the changes community, the first one, was an attempt to be a community. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a group to get together and exchange uh, listening, focusing turns. We were trying to find a way to deal with interpersonal conflict and with group decision making. Uh, we wanted to apply listening and focusing to all aspects of our living. Our goal was to become more authentic ourselves. So we used focusing to help us become more honest, mm -hmm. more in touch with what was really going on for us. And we used empathic listening to try to compassionately understand another person. So that's so important to, for me to say that a changes group, the way that I teach it, and I direct people to my manual focusing in community, which is also available in Spanish, available in the store at my website for a $5 download, very accessible, mm -hmm. that it teaches the entire model 
focusing, listening, and how to apply those to the interpersonal conflicts and group decision-making, which are come up in any community. And mm-hmm. that's, from my perspective, that's what our world needs. We need those skills, uh, or we as listening, focusing people can bring those skills to the larger world where you can't solve your interpersonal problems or your international problems by somebody just leaving, yeah. which uh, is our kind of cultural way. Oh, if you don't get along in a group, go start your own group. Well, mm-hmm. you can't always do that. <laughs> so being a community for me means learning to tolerate people who are different. Mm-hmm. You don't throw people out of your community. You, you learn you learn to love their uniqueness. And I guess that's what empathic listening enables. Mm-hmm. You, you, when you're listening to another person in that deep way, you just, you just fall in love with their uniqueness. And that, that bonds you into a community of mutual care. It just motivates you to want to uh, be helpful to the other people. And I think that's what we need in our world. Mm-hmm. I couldn't agree more. It also teaches you a lot about yourself and your own reactions and uh, that kind of listening um, when when we're in a focusing, just in a regular focusing session and we're companioning uh, a focuser in their process, we're always checking our own reaction, our own what's happening also with us while being sort of completely ready to be present and, and reflect what the essence or, or what that person in front of us is is um, communicating. And well, one thing, I'm as you were saying that, I'm just wondering about how, obviously you're focusing, your personal focusing was developing within the changes groups and there were goals within the changes groups. What was happening it, did you have personal focusing partnerships at that time? Were you still doing regular focusing outside of the changes groups and then taking what you were learning back into those groups? Yes, uh, we were, and we had all kinds of other community activities. We didn't, we didn't all live together, although some of us lived together and used listening focusing to work out the situations that came up there. We also tried to share resources. We shared our cars and our vacuum cleaners and our photography studios. We had a food co-op. So there was a lot of interaction going on as well as the exchange of turns. We were like really a community. Mm -hmm. And it it was one of the deepest experiences of of my life, being part of the community the community where listening and focusing could imbue everything that we did. And uh, that's pretty much become my vocation is to help other people have that experience of community. So yes, we did turns. We did, uh, we kind of rescued people or people came to us in a lot of distress. And so we would first start using listening and focusing to help them get grounded uh, that's how I became involved. I was freaking out at one point and uh, went to Mary Hendricks, who later became Mary Hendricks Jenlin, as a fellow graduate student. And she started doing listening and focusing with me. And she was the first person to say to me, you are not crazy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, we did a lot of that in those days. Yeah, yeah. As Jenlin writes in his paper, Beyond Roles, we were breaking out of the old roles Mm-hmm. And that can make you feel pretty crazy. So in terms of the formal development of focusing, so we were all doing a lot of it uh, on our personal conflicts and everything else. But also uh, Jen Lin was, he's an, a phenomenological researcher. Uh, we would more formally at uh, the meetings, he would observe us doing focusing turns closing our eyes and going inside and he would ask us what we were doing and that helped him to articulate the six step process that he put in his focusing book Mm -hmm. and he did the same thing in terms of how he developed the thinking at the edge, the TAE process. 
He would be, have workshops with people like Nada Lou there, helping, watching people do this uh, theory creation and pulling out steps that could be articulated. So it's a phenomenological process, looking at what's happening and then trying to find a, a way to describe it in steps. Was it also from the very, very start a body thing? Was was that something that was discovered or something that you sort of approached as a group or intellectually and then the sort of discovery that these shifts and changes were happening in our bodies, that, that there was a, a, a kind of a body communication going on? Where, where did that start to happen in, in focusing from, from where you sat at that time? So Jen Lin had already for years been developing his psychology and his philosophy around bodily felt meaning. So we didn't create that. I think you could find his earlier articles and uh, books included that. And in fact, people who have talked to Jenlin about, well, where did the idea of focusing come from? Uh, there's an example from when he was uh, an immigrant uh, to America and didn't speak much English and in third or fourth grade, uh, groping for words and his teacher saying, well, just pay attention to your body sense. She didn't use those words, but mm -hmm he was already aware of that. And then there's a story of when he was in the Navy standing on a ship and uh, realizing that he could bring back the body feel of a dream image. So that the body feel was very grounded in his, probably the dissertation he was working on in philosophy. It, it was there. So I think he already was teaching us in his 10-week uh, first class to close your eyes, go inside, and pay attention to the body sense because it will unfold. So, so he had that. It was more a matter of, well, how could you break it down into some kind of steps you could put in a self-help book that, mm -hmm. uh, that we helped him with. Which is our, what's known as clearing space in the... Uh Jenlin focusing. Other st strands of focusing have developed, but that's the, the one. And I would encourage anyone who hasn't experienced that book to um, get a copy of Eugene Jenlin's Focusing. It's a, it's a wonderful, still to this day, a fantastic introduction to the process we're talking about here. Um, and it is available in so many different languages. And through the Focusing Institute website, people can find teachers in their geographical area in their own language as well as online. So, uh, yes, it's the mission of the Focusing Institute is to make focusing findable and accessible. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we're, of which we're both members. And we are. So I, I wanted to say a little more. You were talking about how the activity of doing empathic listening is also a growth, uh, a growing experience for the listener, and that you, you as a listener, you become aware of your reactivity. Mm -hmm. And I want to stress that so strongly. It is, it's like a meditation on prejudice and stereotyping and how they creep in mm -hmm. and the instruction for empathic listening is to set aside all of your own assumptions judgments expectations and uh, and it's hard to do that and as you say that in itself is a discipline to be the listener and observe all the things of your own that want to get in the way and also if you do this empathic listening as Carl Rogers did it, you will find out over and over again that it doesn't go the way you thought it was going to go, mm -hmm. that what unfolds in the focuser is always so nonlinear and such a surprise mm -hmm. that you end up saying, gosh, I'm really glad I didn't try to tell this person what to do because what, they, what their body has come up with on its own is just so much more authentic as a next step for them. 
and completely and I, meaningful to them, like uh, like a, at a level of meaning that another person could probably not fully ever understand. Exactly that I call it instant ahas. Like yeah. when you have a body knowing, a bodily felt shift, you know. It's not guessing anymore. It's like, oh, I know what I need to do now. I know what my next step. Yes, it's that uh, total body uh, level of insight. And I wanted to just say a little bit about being on the receiving end of empathic listening also. Mm -hmm. So inner relationship focusing, as Ann Weiser Cornell and then Barbara McGavin created it, is has been developed as a way that people really can do focusing on their own without a listener. Mm -hmm. And it's a very powerful and very skillful way of being with the different parts of yourself or the different aspects of a problem in a compassionate way and being able to move through on your own. However, I think that uh, emphasis on being able to do it on your own has led even when people do inner relationship focusing in a partnership, they have less need for the kind of empathic listening mm -hmm. that Carl Rogers did and that we did in the original changes group. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to say these are two different things. You can use inner relationship focusing to work on things by yourself. You can also do it with a companion. But this getting together to be to receive empathic listening mm -hmm. where you as the focuser are just closing your eyes and trying to pay attention to the felt sentience of your living the mm -hmm. ongoing uh, body sense of your issue and then the other person tries to say that back in a kind of a rich and nuanced way and their words uh, hit you is not the right <laughs> way to say it, but there you hear your own words you said coming back at you, back to you, and and you can check them against that body feel, and you can say, oh no, it's not that, it's more like this, or you can say, oh my gosh, you really got it, that that's exactly it, and this experience of being gotten by or grasped by another person mm -hmm. it's a different thing from working things out by yourself yeah. It's yeah so powerful for me it was always about being seen the way to not feel crazy was to be seen by another person and mm -hmm. that was the experience in the original changes for me mm. that i could find myself see myself more deeply because I was being grasped and seen by another person, this empathic listener. And uh, Martin Buber calls that the I-thou versus I-it experience. Mm -hmm. And it's a time, it's a moment when the boundaries between the two people fall away and you, you have a sense of entering into this uh, kind of sacred space, this uh, weeing, we call it, this mm -hmm. space that is something more than you as two individuals and for me that is a moment of empathic bonding i call it which leads people to be a community mm -hmm. and, and that's what we need in the world we need empathic bonding we need to feel i love this other human being i love all these other human beings and i'm going to do what i can to help them and to understand them so that's different it's just a different thing a different goal than solving your own problems by yourself. And that can be done in such a small way, like with your most mundane daily interactions can be heightened to a mini focusing level, I would call it. It's part of my living in a focusing way. But there are so many people possibly in our day that we just do not acknowledge. Um, for example, I'll give an example of I often see people um, going up to a cash register to pay for something while on the telephone. Mm -hmm. and just shoving uh, whatever they're purchasing underneath the nose of a human being in front of them and not no longer having the moment to you know to to interact that to, to acknowledge that there's a person in front of them um 
so there's there's this sort of disconnection that happens in those moments. So I'm looking for in my living in a focusing way, you know, life model, my own personal research is I'm I'm always looking for those points of eye contact, those points of human connection. Um, in Italian, we call it as guardo, like when you can just see someone else and they see you, and there's a even a facial expression exchange there's something being communicated there and something changes in that in the air in the space between you and sometimes it even has an effect on other people like there's Mm -hmm. sometimes you have this moment of oh just a coming down kind of moment um but there was something also i wanted to touch on that that um as you were speaking is that one thing i learned about uh becoming a good focusing companion and a good empathic listener. And this happened, I I can't remember articulate exactly when it happened in my own process, but all of a sudden there was a moment where I could be that way with myself. Uh When I started focusing, I found it very easy to be present to someone else. And yes, of course, I I would like to be helpful and listen and reflect properly and do this right, quote, unquote, Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then I had this amazing moment of saying, wow, I can be this way with all my inner spaces. You know, I can I can bring a new level of empathy and compassion to how I treat myself and these people parts within me that emerge or want to communicate or have something to say or um, are, are, you know, emerging or whatever, it completely, like just the, the, the training of becoming a companion to another person had a, a, a really profound effect on my, my own inner listening, which was not there when I started focusing. So Yeah, what a good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, was, yeah. it was really powerful for me. It was a powerful moment. And I also think... Um, Again, Ann Weiser Cornell has come up with wonderful ways to help people learn how to be with themselves. So I'm not, I'm just talking about something different, not putting down what that is. For some people, learning to be with yourself inside in a loving way happens first by receiving that kind of loving attention from another person. So you were saying just being the listener taught you how to be more compassionate with yourself. Mm -hmm. But I'm also saying for some of us, receiving that empathic understanding from another person is the beginning of being able to incorporate that and do that inside of ourselves. So not being Ann Weiser Cornell and being my own self, Mm -hmm. I always taught listening first. And I always taught Uh, listening focusing turns first Mm -hmm. rather than trying to teach focusing alone first because I came more from the experience or the model that it's getting it from somebody on the outside that eventually helps you really give yourself that kind of self-empathy. It's just different ways of, of going about it. Please tune in for part two of our conversation about changes groups with Dr. Kathy McGuire. You've been listening to The Focusing Way Podcast. Our podcast is available on iTunes and Stitcher. For links and to subscribe, visit our website at thefocusingway.com. Follow us on Twitter at The Focusing Way. Please share this podcast with others as a way of introducing them to the people, themes, concepts, and beauty of focusing. If you really enjoy this and want to support us, you can support us using Patreon as well. Until next time, I'm your host, David Battistella.